Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, taxes and racial inequality. Although many Americans view tax through the lens of paying and filing taxes, tax policy and laws touch nearly every aspect of life. The birth of a new child brings an additional tax credit, or the death of a loved one often leaves the bereaved to grapple with taxes on the estate. But the current nature of some tax policies and laws can reinforce inequality in America, highlighting the need for diversity in the tax field and economics at large to move beyond the status quo. Here to talk more about this subject is Francine Lippman, a professor of law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Francine, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Dave. It's great to be back. All right. Now, you recently did an interview for us on this subject. Can you tell our listeners about your guest? I was thrilled to have the chance to interview Dr. Derek Hamilton, who's a preeminent stratification economist. As of September 1st, he's returning to the new school as a university professor, and he's going to launch a new center for the new school dealing with a study of race and economics. All right, could you give listeners a little preview of what you're going to talk about? Absolutely. It's a great podcast. Dr. Hamilton helps me think critically about tax. Specifically, what we do is we connect the dots for systemic racism in the tax system to racial wealth inequality. Dr. Hamilton has compelling empirical evidence that has demonstrated that a college graduate who is Black has less wealth than a white high school dropout. And this is predominantly because of systemic racism in the tax system, as well as truly throughout just about all of our systems. Dr. Hamilton helps me think more critically about how we can push the tax system to be equal for all taxpayers. All right, let's go to that interview. So, Derek, it's great to have you again in a discussion. I've been thinking a lot about diversity and inclusion, and unfortunately, the lack of diversity and inclusion in certain industries And I read a critical tax scholar speaking about occupational segregation. And you and I, Derek, have been on a lot of panels, and you know that we've worked hard to try to bring into the discussion scholars of color, especially scholars of color who are in tax, finance, economics, and shockingly, there are so few. It's occupational segregation. When you look at the statistics, they're really appalling. Black tax partners in CPA firms, 0.3%, less than 1%, one third of 1%. Black law partners, better, but still horrible, 2.1% and 1.8% are equity partners. So a lot of these black law partners are segregated into non-equity, so not sharing in the profits. Similarly, black attorneys, 5% of all lawyers, and black women lawyers, only 1.9%. This occupational segregation has ramifications. So what are the demographics in economics and how can we make this better? The demographics in economics, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. However, what I'm pretty sure I know is that in any given year, there is never more than literally 16 Black economists that graduate with a PhD. And there have been years when it has been four or zero as well. I think it's typically like eight U.S.-born Black economists that graduate with a PhD in economics. So that speaks to perhaps a pipeline issue, but we need to understand that pipeline issues are endogenous. They don't just appear amorphously, that there's a a mechanism and reason for which they arise. And then also, if we look, as you have described with the legal profession, If we disaggregate within occupations, so if we look in the ranks of full professors, the ranks of tenured professor, 
we're going to find even greater scarcity in the discipline. That's clear. That's evident. There's been a lot of reports describing gender, but the dimensions of race and gender are abysmal and even more with regards to race when we look at a field like economics. So let's think about even the, the question of why does it matter, right? What, why do we care? The first answer is we want elite positions desegregated. We would want equity with regards to having access to professional jobs that are considered desirable or even elite for that matter. But then there's another reason why it's valuable, and that is moving us beyond the status quo of ideas, that a recognition that people enter endeavors with some preconceived notions of how things work, some experiences that they bring into the questions they ask, some understandings of phenomena that are specific to the background from which they come. So if we want to have better ideas in the discipline, if we want to have better understanding of economic relationships, then we should be promoting people to come in with fresh and new ideas to move us beyond the status quo, particularly in a context where we've had growing inequality in this country for so long. And if economics is charged with understanding distribution of resources, then I think as a discipline, we should be doing better. So for the social good, we should be advocating for diversity and inclusion. And then let me make one final last point as it relates to what we began with, which is this so-called pipeline issue and the ways in which it can be endogenous or relational to the aspects of the structure itself. The explanation in, in economics for persistent group inequality oftentimes comes down to some human capital explanation that the orthodoxy is that if markets are functioning correctly, then you have a fair, efficient distribution of resources. Those that are deserving get rewarded. Those that are undeserving will have to find something else to do over time because the market should sanction them away. This is part of the orthodoxy. So if you are from, say, a subaltern Black background, and the discipline is telling you that the reason for this persistent inequality has to do with deficits within Black people, either they don't have the skill set or they have some cultural affect that is detrimental to their success, then that becomes off-putting in and of itself that that's not a discipline that attracts people who might be interested in understanding this question if it's vacuous with limits to only those type of explanations. And that's ironic because we need those people to come up with alternative theories and understandings, not that white people can't, but as I mentioned, there is value to coming to problems with diverse perspectives so that you can have greater insights on how to address them beyond the status quo. Absolutely. And an uh, individual who I've been working with, who is a Black tax partner in a CPA firm, we were talking about the fact that because of COVID-19 and the economic crisis, many Black businesses, small businesses are failing, like 50% are failing. And one of the comments that he was saying is, often they don't access perhaps resources in their community, financial advice. Again, it becomes self-perpetuating because they don't have neighbors and colleagues who are the Black CPA in the firm, who are the Black tax accountant or tax lawyer. And so they've been segregated from not only that occupation, but those resources. That's right. I mean, our conception of resources should include the fact that networks are a resource and having access to people who might even be willing to give you free services <laughs> because you're a network. Those are accounting attributes that oftentimes don't go measured. But that said, probably the number one reason that Black businesses are vulnerable in this COVID-19 experience is capital resources. We know that the racial wealth gap is enormous, and the most critical ingredient for a successful business is capital itself. So we have undercapitalized businesses. Businesses aren't going under because they lack ingenuity or they lack skills to function. The number one reason is they were undercapitalized to begin with. And now with COVID-19, where you need capital to sustain yourself, and even a banking relationship, even with the federal interventions that distributed resources to small businesses, 
they were done so through banks. And if you did not have a line of credit or an existing relationship with a bank, then you were disproportionately vulnerable to going under. And this is the narrative of Black businesses. Absolutely. And that network is so critical. We see that in the academy as well. Mentors, mentees. Without that, it's a recipe for failure. Really quick, I love that you phrased it, mentors and mentees, because another trope that we say is we lack role models. Well, I think the key thing is the mentor and mentorship, because it's more than just seeing somebody that looks like you, it's having someone who's willing to share with you, which is where networks and mentorship comes in. Absolutely. And I do, as you know, a lot of pro bono work and outreach. And of course, I reach out to individuals to help them navigate so many of these issues during COVID-19. And if you're not hooked into that network, you're not going to know about these loans. You're not going to know about a lot of the resources out there. And so, it's access, access to capital, human capital, relationships, networking. Now, as an economist, so our audience here are all tax professionals. And so we are in awe and in respect and a little bit of ignorance about economists. And so you are a stratification economist. What does that mean? Yeah, so it is intentionally an unusual term. And why is it intentionally unusual? Because as I alluded earlier, our discipline has not done, in my mind, as well as others, an adequate job of explaining persistent group-based inequality. The explanations reduce to some deficit within the population that's underperforming. And that is counter the empirical evidence that has been uncovered by myself and several other colleagues. For instance, not only does racial disparity persist, it persists at high levels of education as well, and in fact often grows. That a Black person with a college degree will get a lower return to their investment in health relative to a white person with a college degree than Blacks and whites overall. And you know, I'll translate that really quick. The mortality rate for Black people relative to white people between the ages of 25 and 60 is about a 50% higher mortality rate. And that's abysmal in and of itself. But if we look only within those with a college degree, it's a 70% higher mortality rate for blacks relative to whites. So education is not the panacea. It does not protect black people in the same way that it protects white people. I talked about it in terms of health, but if I look at wealth, if I look at wages, you get similar phenomena. And that leads me to understand that it can't be just skills, that there are productive returns associated with identity itself. So stratification economics is a field that is interested in not looking at gender, race, immigrant status on the periphery, but as a modus of understanding, putting it up front as, as again, not a sidebar, but a mode of study and analysis. And it also recognizes that, unfortunately, there are productive returns to one's investment in those identity in both economic, education, and health domains. And that's what the field is about, trying to understand and study those relationships. And likewise, policy responses that we can implement so as to make it so that there are not these returns in an economic domain to one's race or gender. That's an immoral society, not an enlightened one. I do think COVID-19 has put such pressure on our economy that we're seeing these fractures between race and gender literally explode on the front lines with Black essential workers dying at a horrifically higher rate businesses going down because, as you say, lack of access to capital and just the anger and frustration with this continuous, nonstop, unrelenting murder of Black men and women from the police force. And what is so frustrating, but perhaps hopeful, is COVID-19 has put pressure on this, so we're seeing this, and your work and others is now getting New York Times attention and frontline media, with a presidential race, 
your work is getting adopted and we're seeing this in tax proposals. And so talk about the pros and cons of that. So let me start with some of the things that were mentioned in your question, which is the devaluing of Black lives and interactions with law enforcement. Now that has become vivid. We've had some incidences this summer, which sadly aren't new. This has been part of our human history. Perhaps what is part new is the cell phone and the ability to display it dramatically in real time, right before our very eyes without ambiguity, as well as a new generation of young people that are intolerant to this type of injustice in ways that maybe collectively, you know, Black people have always protested it, but there is an expanded movement of people beyond just Black people and other groups that are really hell-bent on trying to get justice. It is not a leap of faith to see that this valuation and law enforcement interaction is also relevant in transactions more broadly. When we think about broader political economy, one's identity, race or gender or different types of identity, depending on the context, can lead to a devaluation in that transaction. And there were a lot of incidents that took place this summer. The one that is most vivid of what it is I'm describing might not have been the most lethal. In fact, it wasn't the most lethal, but it was the Central Park incident when you had the woman walking her dog and the bird watcher. Now, I'm a New Yorker, and in New York transactions, there's conflict. You know, if, in and of itself, the fact that she had her dog off the leash in a park where she needed to have the dog on the leash, I don't think that's a huge deal in New York. She could have said, mind your own business. If my dog barked bothering you, that's not atypical in a New York transaction or interaction. What became problematic is when she weaponized her racial identity. She understood that there is a historical and contemporary context in which law enforcement will treat Black people differently than white people. And she used that as a weapon in that negotiation. That's a vivid account of the ways in which one's racial identity can have value in public transaction. Again, that wasn't the most lethal one, but that was so evident and clear. You know, the other aspect is COVID-19 is amplifying underlying structures that were already in existence. The fact that Black people are, as well as Latinx populations, have limited resources to begin with. And as a result of that limited resource, you know, people might say, well, they're more vulnerable because of pre-existing conditions. Well, pre-existing conditions have pre-existing conditions. They aren't just random. They result from lack of resource as well as a context in which they engage in, in health and get treated differently in that engagement. We need to understand that, that our conception of what we say as given, exogenous, or pre-existing is not, it is part of a larger system by which people have less access to resources and are treated differently. That needs to be crystal clear. But I guess the larger point is that COVID-19 amplified existing disparities that were already latent in a way that are evident, obviously racialized. And then a couple of other points on that is probably our political economy response is racialized. What we deemed essential workers and our tolerance for when we're willing to open up an economy or not is very racialized. Our tolerance for how much public support we're going to intervene with to protect workers and people is very racialized. I think we need to understand that as well. And then a final point is that with these pre-existing conditions, and by pre-existing, I mean racism, <laughs> they get amplified under a pandemic like COVID-19. I'd like to make the point that these things are choices that with virtually every economic downturn, we can make a policy decision to not have these racial disparities, that these things are not inevitable. We can intervene in ways so as to be protective in a way that includes shared prosperity, regardless of one's race, gender, or class position. During economic downturns, we typically end up in a recovery that's unequitable where those with capital, those that are white, end up recovering faster and sadly might very well be made better off than when we started in a relative sense. So we need to understand that as well, that in this COVID-19 pandemic, we don't have to have a recovery like we had in the Great Recession, which led to even greater inequality. 
we can have a more equitable recovery. And with that more equitable recovery, we will be more resilient in a widespread manner for the next pandemic because we'll have better resource people throughout the population. Absolutely. And so many of these issues are systemic, institutionalized racism that is not new. It's over 400 years old. And so it's got to take Herculean efforts to start to to move this elephant in a more progressive manner. So how does your work and your research and your compelling empirical evidence inform tax reform? So I, I think we need to start with values and also a recognition that tax policy is the premier biggest fiscal tool that governments have. We think about tax credits in a way that's separable from subsidy, when in fact they very well could be the same of, I'm going to mess up the metaphor, a double-edged sword, whatever the metaphor is supposed to be. They should not be separable in our concept. So to begin with, when we have a tax credit, everything should be refundable. It's arbitrary and silly to cut it off for people who don't have as much tax liability. We should certainly, in fairness, be able to offer their full benefit from the tax code, regardless of their income, and we shouldn't arbitrarily cut them off. That should be front and center, period. Then thinking about values, governments that are well-functioning should promote economic inclusion, civic engagement, and social equity. They should be promoting our shared prosperity. And the tax code should be front and center in promoting that. So colleagues and I have been working on guaranteed income, using our tax code in a way that literally eliminates poverty. And we already have guaranteed income somewhat in place with the earned income tax credit structure. Now, the earned income tax credit structure could be modified in a way that, one, does not arbitrarily, and I'm using the word arbitrarily almost in quotes, but maybe politically arbitrarily, cuts off those people who are not working. Work requirements is a political choice. We should, in my view, literally get rid of poverty in America. The the nation is wealthy enough and has a great deal amount of resources where poverty can be eliminated. And we can use the tax code to do so with the existing earned income tax credit structure. So not only can we eliminate poverty with our tax code, we could also extend the earned income tax credit, not just as an anti-poverty program, but as a mechanism to lift families up to the middle class. We can index to the median income in a way that's lifting others up to the middle class by offering them income supports not in a universal basic income framework, but in a gradational framework similar to how we have the earned income tax credit structure. So let me summarize really quickly, literally eliminate poverty, and then second, lift families up to the middle class with a guaranteed income approach that is different from UBI because those that are wealthy, if they get a basic income that's the same as somebody who is poor, you are pretty much subsidizing their wealth. A poor person, by definition, is subsistence and consumes. A wealthy person can use that additional income to invest and therefore lead to even greater inequality. Also, it's kind of inflationary. It's almost the definition of inflation to literally give everybody in the economy the same income. So using the tax code in a way that is civically engaged, why shouldn't everybody, you know, tax day should be a day similar to voting that everybody takes part in, it's part of your civic duty, and why do we arbitrarily exclude people at the low end? I mean, that's kind of a rhetorical question, but in my view of a well-functioning democracy, they would be included, not to be taxed, they already are taxed with consumption tax, but they should get a refundable income through our EITC structure that guarantees income and eliminates poverty. One of the concepts that you've pushed out broadly and successfully is baby bonds. 
So while a baby bonds are a infusion of capital at birth, it's done outside of the tax system, but it's remindful to me of the refundable child tax credit. So why don't you tell us what baby bonds are and then compare and contrast with refundable child tax credits and maybe pros and cons for each. Yeah, and you know, whether it's through our tax code or not, again, the, these could be design issues if we so desired, right? Whether Treasury is administering through IRS or through Social Security, these become political implementation ideas that clever people can figure out ways to implement. But the basic idea of baby bonds is, we talked about earlier that a big source of inequality is capital itself, that some people have an endowment that allows them to purchase an asset that will passively appreciate over their lifetime. The difference between a renter and a homeowner is often a down payment. The difference between a worker who is very creative and an entrepreneur was capital itself. That creative worker will generally have to sell their idea in the form of wages to an entrepreneur who can implement it. So what Baby Bonds is intended to do is to provide everyone with a capital foundation irrespective of the race, gender, or family that they're born into when they are a young adult. Trust funds for every American. That's what this is. So it would be a trust held by the federal government. It would be funded based on the family position, financial position in which you're born into. So it would be universal, like Social Security, promoting a stakeholder society, promoting civic engagement, similar to the value I described earlier, economic inclusion and social equity. But the accounts would be seeded in a way that offers those with the least resources the most. And when they become a young adult, they would be able to use these resources to get into either home ownership, some capital to start a business, financing a debt-free education so that you can have a managerial or professional job that affords you some of the retirement savings that might come along with that job, like a 401k, for instance or you can roll it over in a retirement IRA type account until you're ready to use it or until you become retired. That's the basic concept. So if I juxtapose it with refundable child tax credits, I would say that two things. One, both are necessary and they're complements. So baby bonds, you know, by design, families can't use them when the child is just that, a child. Ironically, it's intended to, in some ways, I'm going to use a word that tax attorneys know a lot about, divorce. It's intended to divorce children from the families in which they're born in a way that they will have financial capital waiting for them that they get to use, and it's not dependent on the choices that their parents make, good or otherwise. Of course, it doesn't exclude other forms of savings that parents can do for their children, but this it, in and of itself is reserved strictly for the child. And, you know, people can rightfully say, well, what about when the child is growing up? And my response to that is there is no silver bullet American policy that we need a package of good that is aimed to address insecurity in its various domains. Absolutely. I think that too often we want soundbite answers to really complicated problems, and it takes a village, and it's going to take a menu of different solutions. So, for example, I heard recently that the discussion about the wage disparity between men and women and when you juxtapose a black woman's wage disparity against a white man, the difference over a career was a million dollars. And so when you talk about the difference in wealth and the ability to accumulate wealth and security and retirement benefits and all of the resources that that million dollars can buy, you can see that we're going to need so many different systems through the tax code, outside of the tax code, et cetera, et cetera. And the baby bonds is a way to infuse this capital and start to reverse this trend. When you talk about the racial wealth gap, it's 
phenomenally oppressive and depressing, especially when you have compared the college graduate African American to a high school dropout. I know I've seen those statistics. A few points. One is, first, let me give shout outs. Shout outs to Senator Cory Booker and Representative Ayanna Presley for championing Baby Bond through Congress. And it's gaining momentum, which I love and adore. And I love your point about how resources exponentially grow. That having a well-resourced young adult not only provides security for them at that point, the ways in which wealth is created is, you know, it's always wealth that begets more wealth. It was capital in the first place that provides you the ability to generate more capital. And it grows exponentially throughout one's life course. So that, that's why, you know, we have social security, which is one of America's best public policies to ensure that we have security in old age. But we don't have a whole lot of policy apparatus when people are just starting out their young adulthood beyond subsistence policy. So Baby Bonds is intended to kind of bridge, and I'm gonna use a good phrase of Kilolo Kijikasi, who's at Urban Institute, build economic security over a life course. And if we think of social security as one stage of that, as we go into the twilight of our life, Baby bonds could be one of the premier stage when you begin building a lifetime of economic security. The last point I'll say on this is related to tax, and that is many of us only conceive of tax and its collection capacities. We don't consider the fact that it seeds assets in so many domains, home mortgage deductions, differences in the ways in which we tax capital gains versus wages. These are all subsidies towards asset promotion. The problem isn't that we do this. The problem is to whom it's distributed. That's the problem, that we are seeding resources in an unequitable way, in a way that's not promoting social equity, economic inclusion, and even civic engagement, that we could think about our tax policy, not just from collection standpoint, but as a mechanism to fuel, to seed, to stimulate, and we can do it in a much more equitable way through programs not only like baby bonds, but similar to baby bonds that provide asset security in more egalitarian ways. So as you describe, it's going to take a lifelong menu of capital accumulation, birth from baby bonds, some sort of earned income tax credit, child tax credit, as we know, between zero and three or zero and five children, vulnerable children, truly need an infusion of capital into their household just so they have decent growth, decent nutrition and housing and et cetera. And the return on that investment is phenomenal. And then, as you said, once these baby bonds mature and a young adult thinks about starting their education or their business, they have some capital. So tax professionals, as I said earlier in our conversation, when we think about economics, and some, sometimes it just doesn't feel accessible, are there any resources or books or websites or organizations like your own that tax professionals can tap into to think more broadly about tax reform? Read everything I write. No, that was just a joke. <laughs> that was intended to be Me a joke. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think shout outs to places like the Roosevelt Institute, thinking about Groundwork Collaborative. These are organizations that I partner with a lot. Policy Link, right? I, I think they have done a great deal of work. There's the Women's Tax Law Center. Shouldn't exclude them as well. Of course, your work, Francine. Big shout out to all the stuff you do particularly with regards to immigration and inclusion of people regardless of nativity. We could shout out our colleague Dorothy Brown, who's been doing a great deal of work in bridging economic concepts into tax policy. So, you know, I'd say there's a plethora of information out there and challenge economics. Don't just take it as given. That is something I hope that your colleagues, tax law professionals and professors come to grips with also is that it isn't just fact or destiny, some of the theories that economists put out there with regards to incentive structures, notions of markets being efficient. I mean, at the end of the day, a good friend at Demos, the person who runs it, Sabil Muhammad, he describes clearly that markets are a political construction. 
even when we talk about a farmer's market, it doesn't exist unless a political entity offers a permit. So these are, aren't just inevitable destiny. We choose markets themselves. I'm an economist. I'm a proud economist. Economists have a great deal to offer and many insights, but they're not unchallengeable. Don't take what we say as gospel. Be willing to push back, consider context, etc. I also think what's important and what I find so engaging about your work, and frankly, I reached out to Dr. Hamilton just from reading one of his pieces, and he was very responsive. So tax professionals don't be intimidated. Reach out to economists and invite them into the conversation because these problems are quite overwhelming. Not one group can solve them. It's going to take all of the villages working together to turn around institutional racism and to really bring everyone into the tent so that all of our lives are enriched and that we continue to grow the economy, especially children. Our vulnerable children, to the extent they're suffering deprivation, is horrific and costly. So what words of wisdom, inspiration, do you have for these challenging times for communities of color and advocates like myself and like many folks who are listening for justice and equality for all? What can we do and how can we help push these issues forward in a positive manner? I love that question. Before I answer, let me say something about incentives and some irony associated with incentives. We have structures where professions are incentivized to not communicate with each other, to try to distinguish themselves from each other so as to produce value, whether fictive or actual, to how important they are and necessary and needed. And that's ironic because to solve these problems, we need not just deft and esoteric approaches that are limited to one domain or one field, but rather being able to talk to each other in interdisciplinary ways. You know, another aspect of this incentives is a lot of our public policy attempts to try to incentivize or coerce behavior. And even with tax policy, where we offer tax incentives of say, we'll give a home ownership credits, we'll give, and this is a policy I'm not fond of, opportunity zones where we incentivize businesses to come into certain areas so that they could generate economic development. And why I'm critical of these is that using these incentives, you often subsidize people who might not have the same objective as social welfare objectives to begin with, not casting judgment, but at the end of the day, they are for-profit entities and will invest in trying to use those incentives to benefit and then also capture as opposed to using those resources in a direct way to provide capital to these communities in the first place. Because as I mentioned, that's the fundamental problem. They're undercapitalized. And if they had the capital, they probably and could be able to do it themselves. And then one other point about the incentives, because I think this is an important one that's not well pervasive in our thought, even something like a first time home buyer's credit, tax credit, if you don't have the initial endowment, then you don't necessarily benefit from it to begin with. In other words, you have some households that have so few resources that they aren't eligible to benefit from the tax credit because they won't have enough of a down payment. We need to think about that when we design policy. You might very well be hastening gentrification in your attempts to provide economic development for a community because those individuals who could be, you know, somebody just graduating from college and well situated with a professional degree, as well as a family that can provide them resources for a down payment, they might be best positioned to benefit from that tax credit than the community you're intended to benefit in the first place. And we do this with local taxes as well. We provide tax abatements. We very well may be hastening gentrification. Well-meaning people need to fundamentally understand that this isn't a question of always incentives and responding to being coerced, but rather capital endowment itself. Areas for hope. What can we be hopeful about? What I think the ultimate solution is, the legal profession is well steeped in thinking about civil rights, thinking about political rights. The evolution for a well-functioning democracy in the 21st century 
is the fulfillment of economic rights, knowing that there will be not a sorting process of access, of quantity and quality, of elements that are fundamental for people to have agency in their lives. And what are those elements? Healthcare, housing. This doesn't guarantee a penthouse apartment, but it guarantees adequate housing. Food, people should not be hungry in the 21st century. That's why we should literally eliminate poverty and we have the resources to do it. So it's a conceptualization that the fulfillment of human rights requires that people are adequately resourced so that they can have true agency. We talk about the market as if it facilitates choice and freedom. But if you don't have resources, you are at the whim of markets. You don't have choice and freedom. To have authentic agency in your life, you need a baseline level of resources, period. And when we evolve to that point, that is a well-enlightened 21st century society that does not stratify us in a way that makes groups vulnerable based on their race, gender. This is where we need to evolve, and economic rights is a critical ingredient in order for us to reach that we think about markets as if they're dogmatic, that this is natural, they're efficient, they're fair, they're colorblind, they separate those into deserving and undeserving, and that's almost a dogmatic expectation and understanding of the way things work. And as I mentioned, I challenged us to question that, to push back on that. Here's where I think we need to be dogmatic. Justice. Commit to justice as a matter of faith. When asked the question of, can this politically happen in this day and time, given the way we are, if it's just and you believe in it, commit to it. I shouldn't preach and tell other people what to do. I can speak from my own perspective. To me, that becomes a question that is valuable with regards to planning. But for me, regardless of whether a policy that is just will occur today, tomorrow, or 30 years from now, I'm going to commit to it as a matter of faith because I believe in justice. And what's so interesting about these goals, the economic justice, is that it is going to require everyone in the tent, enrolled agents, CPAs, attorneys, tax professionals, economists, academics, tax law professors. We all have to come together to think critically. And as you said, are these ideas practicable? What's the effect on the street with these policies? So if we can tease out this enthusiasm and join Dr. Hamilton and myself, and let's make some good trouble. Representative John Robert Lewis and Elijah Cummings are watching us, and they are charging us with making good trouble and being passion warriors on the front lines of justice. Thank you, Francine. I'm so happy that you are my colleague, and even more important, my friend. Pleasure to always speak with you. The feeling is mutual. And now, coming attractions. Each week we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now from her home is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief Faye McRae. Faye, what will you have for us? Thank you, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, three professors from the University of Houston, Victoria, summarized the relief available to self-employed individuals with employees. David Mattingly explores cross-border tax aspects of blocker entities. In Tax Notes State, Tram Lee examines how states are trying to generate revenue by imposing tax on digital goods and services. Stephen Krantz, Lauren Ferranti, and Kathleen Quinn argue that the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania erred in its recent synths ruling by failing to analyze the plain language of the statute at issue. In Tax Notes International, Lewis Greenwald and Haley Gleaney discuss the ins and outs of claiming an IRC Section 165G worthless stock deduction. Tatiana Falco considers whether proposals to tax the digital economy could be expanded to the international shipping industry. And on the opinions page, Joseph Thorndike takes a closer look at the Republican Party and discusses how quickly and thoroughly a party can change its governing philosophy where extinguished circumstances change. 
Stephanie Sung Johnson and Robert Goulder discuss the recent Apple state aid decision. You can read all that and a lot more in the pages of Tax Notes Federal, State, and International. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at Tax Do, that's S T E W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening, and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Analyst Inc. does not provide tax advice or tax preparation services. Nothing in the podcast constitutes legal, accounting, or tax advice. A full disclaimer is included in the transcript.